This is our annual Meet the Fellows event. It's our first in-person Meet the Fellows event since 2019. So it's been a while for us to be together in this way. It's really an honor to have you all here in person and for the audience viewing through live stream from around Charlottesville, the nation and around the world, actually, are all here to hear about our wonderful fellows, both pre-doctoral and postdoctoral fellows, who are doing extraordinary research across disciplines like history, anthropology, women's gender and sexuality studies, Africana studies, African American studies, and across all geographic regions from Southern Africa, West Africa, South Carolina, Brazil, Colombia, and many more. So we'll hear much more about their research in a quick five minute synopsis. And this Meet the Fellows event really is the official kickoff of our workshop schedule that happens throughout the year. So roughly every Wednesday, sometimes every other Wednesday, fellows get to workshop their chapters, inviting a guest interlocutor, internationally renowned scholar who will come to review their work in great detail. And in these workshops, the other fellows, along with the guest interlocutor, Woodson faculty, other invited faculty, will come and give dedicated time to that particular fellow's work. And it's an extraordinary intellectual community to be a part of that work, advancing the interdisciplinary work of black studies across space and time to be able to work together to further our own individual projects, but to work in community, in collaboration. It's the secret sauce of the Woodson, in my humble opinion. And so we continue the tradition since 1981. The Woodson Institute for African American and African Studies has invited over 180 scholars to be part of this community. You continue that tradition. Those 180 scholars have won all the major prizes in our field, the Bancroft, the Levin, many, many more. I published many of the books that you see here and elsewhere. They have been placed at the leading universities all over the world. Our fellows last year all placed universities like NYU, University of Richmond, gotten postdoctoral fellows, and this class will be no different. So I've gone on and on without actually introducing myself. <laughs> I'm Robert Trent Vincent. I have the great honor to be the director and chair of the Carter G. Wilson Institute for African American and African Studies. I have the great honor to be chair of a wonderful academic department with wonderful faculty and also director of this research institute with our wonderful fellows. I will stop here because you didn't come to hear me. You came to hear about these fellows, so I'll just very quickly tell you where we're going. I will introduce our first fellow, Zalika Iberimi, who cannot be with us today. She will be with us presenting her presentation for five minutes, and then she will introduce Sean Armstead, and then we will go in alphabetical order after that, where each fellow will give their five-minute synopsis, and then introduce the next fellow, who will take five minutes and five minutes only. <laughs> and then at the end, we will have an opportunity to ask questions, further the conversation over food and drink for our reception. That's a way it is. So that is where we're going. So I have the great honor to introduce to you our second year pre-doctoral fellow, Zalika Iberimi, who is a pre-doctoral fellow finishing her dissertation at the University of Texas at Austin in the Department of African American Studies. 
and her dis dissertation is entitled Haunted Femmes, Haunting Spectators, Modalities of Black Desire, Pleasure, and Sexual Change. Zalika, take it away. Greetings, everyone. I want to first of all thank um, you, Dr. Benson, for a hearty welcome. And I also want to thank you for your leadership um, here at the Carter Duplison Institute. I would also like to thank um, just my colleagues and also the staff as well who have uh, worked very, very hard. So I just was very thankful for this space. So I'm going to jump right into my project. Um, there has been like a slight tweet uh, as I've been doing the vision. Um, with my work, um, but it's, it's good, it's a good uh, sort of adjustment. So, haunted femmes haunting spectators, the black sexual logics of desire, pleasure, and shame, questions for black intramural material and digital publics, believe it knows as spectators of the being black femme. It argues that black migratory and mid-Atlantic grammar foster queer, quotidian understandings of black female identities that are enacted by the femme. I analyze the literary works Sula, written by Toni Morrison, the work of visual artist and sculptor Doreen Garner, the work of photographer and visual artist Deanna Lawson, the interviews of black trans ballroom icon Octavia Saint Laurent, the Asia Zola uh, King's Twitter thread known as The Story or The Thodicy, and the corporeal augmentation of the Claremont Twins. I place these creative works in conversation with the lives of the deceased, such as Billie Holiday, Lisa Lefty Lopez, Kanika Jenkins, Islam Meadows, Angelia Mangum, and Taisha Ball, and the lives of black women taken by Lonnie Franklin Jr. in Los Angeles. Furthermore, by analyzing shame, the study interrogates ways of knowing black women's desire and pleasure that are rendered inaccessible. I use a black queer feminist method of research creation through critical performance, visual, and textual analysis. As a riff on a study, of Zakia Iman Jackson and Yuri McMillan's engagements with ontology and black physically and object hood, I propose an artistically informed method of black study. It is essential to black study to be critical of ideologized methods. When I say black study, I only mean what Joshua Myers defines through such Robinson's determinations to be a practice of black study, and one that is a practice of denaturalizing Western disciplinary knowledges so that knowledge is ways of thinking and being necessarily obscured by those projects can operate in spaces cleared of this debris. When I say this black study, I also mean that in practice, we assume the role of being critical of which that emerges from the practice itself. Power geographies of the sexually shamed black femme map within material and digital spheres. How are the entrapments of desirability entangled by black femmes and their intramural spectators with this spectral presence of anti-blackness? What ways do digital publics make known the desires of the black femme that are rendered inaccessible to black spectators? Considering the private performances to the public circulation of images, what are the distinctions and commonalities between the selfie, self-portrait, the artist, and the image maker? With consideration of these questions that also lead to many more, I consider both the mundane and spectacular lives, deaths of two black public figures, or black public spheres, the material and the digital. These publics embody a particular enfleshment that perform as communal mirrors. There's a spectatorial complexity to a black enfleshment that interacts with what is horrible, horrific, and haunting, and yet a lot alluring and aspirational. It is aspirational in that these publics do speak to who we may or may not live in the desire to be. That is performed through looking, watching, and gazing as a means to penetrate what we may or may not know or understand about our past, present, and what may become through space and place. Haunted Films Haunting Spectators explores how outcasted black films create their own politics and knowledge production to unique modes of being. One of the interventions that I make in the study is the centering of Philadelphia's language as a site to explore how shame and desire permeate the ontology of the black film figure. Another intervention includes a study of what I recognize as the ontology of the presumed black forebody, as I argue that desire the architect crisis. Additionally, I argue that the circulation of rumors about black films fragment public and private understanding about this figure. And I'm wrapping now because I want to talk about disclosure a little bit for a second. I would like to disclose something here. 
For a few years, I considered whether or not it would be absolutely necessary to disclose. And the question was, what I am actually disclosing, as disclosure as a concept is often violent. My work is not inherently about labor in the sexual economy, and I use a black porn and sex work studies frame for engaging modes of ontology, visual culture, and geography within black settings. This frame developed through my experiences as an adultified queer film child with our own fantasies and desires. This frame developed through my experiences as a former sex worker or a girl who labored in the sexual economy. For many years, the greatest violence of all was not feeling comfortable enough to end disclosing that to myself. By no means am I able to articulate an experiential knowledge of all things of the sexual economy, but I do experientially know a few things. So, this is an elegy for those who find themselves haunted with an unlimentable archive. To not name the violences that they experienced would have been an act of fierce redaction. This is a horror story for the familiar feeling, all too unfamiliar. Horror became a hidden analytic for contending with the specters that war with and obliterate the black being, even if these specters look just like ourselves. This is a love story for the ones who are watched and watched the fact as we struggle to remember them. As we watch, as we spectate, I choose to hold a mirror to myself and us all. I chose to allow for love to haunt me, for love was the only way to engage these subjects in both life and death. And just because this may feel uncomfortable or disorienting, it does not make it any less loving. Next, I will turn it over to my colleague and second year Wood Supreme doctoral fellow, Sean Armstead. Thinking about what inspires my work brings to mind a statement a professor shared with our undergraduate history course years ago, likening himself and his colleagues to three-year-olds. He told us that historians are fueled by a one-worded question, why? Wishing to understand the why the woman I study drives my work, my project, Imagine Solidarities, Black Liberal Internationalism, and the National Council of Negro Women's Journey from Afro-Asian to Pan-African Unity, 1935 to 1975. In some ways, my being a scholar of black international activism makes little sense. I have been out of the country a grand total of one time. Though committed to using my research and teaching to support others' activism, I, do not, I don't see myself as an activist. And to add to this list further, it's hard for me to understand the women I study, namely their beliefs that global justice and peace were possible in their lifetimes. On the other side of this rights movement, the wave of decolonization after World War II, and more recently, the election of the first black president and the frightening turn to a political right across the world, I simply can't relate to them. That I share so little in common with women like Mary McLeod Bethune, Sue Bailey Thurman, Edith Sampson, and other leaders of the National Council of Negro Women and their allies, including Wijaya Lakshmi Pundit of India, Rihanna Liaquat Ali Khan of Pakistan and Flora Zikiwe of Nigeria, to name a few, makes the why loom so large for me. Why did council women seek relationships with women abroad? How did these connections inflect their efforts at home? Why did these relationships fail to yield deeper, more expansive ties? I try to explain the reasons why they sought relationships across difference and geographical spaces. Some believe transnational friendships would discredit the racist explanations that denied them political rights. Others envisioned black American women's leadership over an international women's movement that prioritized, quote, women of the darker races, end quote. In positioning black womanhood as representative of other non-white women the world over, they dismissed the disparaging rhetoric that denied black women's acumen or worthiness of such a role. Thus, they evinced a black feminist politics recognizable to us today. Yet this approach, I have noticed, also spelled trouble for equitable, horizontal ties with their sisters abroad. During my time at the Wilson Institute, I have shifted my focus to mine the intimate, personal, and affective domains of these women's friendships for evidence of their global politics. In so doing, I try to take advice I was given during my workshop in the spring to resist imposing geographical scale on the subjects I study. Put, sim put simply, internationalism, as I have come to understand it, unfolds regardless of travel and requires no critical mass of participants. I find Council Women's international political visions and aspirations enacted through the emotional and interpersonal realm of friendship. I think this goal coincides in a larger trend in the scholarship on black internationalism, which examines the interpersonal and or intimate 
Particularly, I'm thinking here of scholarship produced by Keisha Plain, Dio Gore, Tiffany Floriville, Lisa Loeb, and others, and emerging scholarships such as Joan Flores and Villalobos' new book that I'm really excited to read. In a lot of ways, I feel as if I, 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 as if I had to earn the capacity to engage with such complex, ever-changing worldviews. And blending the personal and global, the national and local, and the spiritual with the secular, these women have tested my ability to, paraphrasing Elsa Barkley Brown here, to isolate one dimension and explore it, and then to place it back into the context of the intellectual whole. I look forward to improving this skill in order to hone my articulations of their ideas and my representations of their subjectivities in the future. Thank you. Now. Thank you, good people. So it is my excitement to introduce our one of our first year predoctoral fellows, Francis Bell. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, so I want to start by uh, thanking Dr. Vinson, Dr. Gaines, uh, everyone else at the Woodson who has put this event together, who's put this whole uh, program together. It's, um, I've only been a fellow for a couple of months and it's already a really exciting place to work and write and think. Um, yeah, so thank you. Um, I study the Haitian diaspora in the early United States between 1790 and 1830, roughly. Uh, I'm going to start with a couple of case studies because I'm primarily approaching my work through case studies and then I'm going to go and talk about the project as a whole. Um, so in 1799, a young man who had been named Voltaire, who called himself Joseph Peters, escaped in Philadelphia. Peters had been taken from revolutionary Haiti to Philadelphia in 1793 by his enslaver, where he had been bound out as an indentured servant to a man named John Carroll. In the runway advertisement that he placed, Carroll described Peters as born in Africa and as speaking French and English. He also noticed, uh, interestingly, that Peters was, quote, fond of singing the Marseillaise, the anthem of the French Revolution. And he speculated that Peters would, quote, endeavor to get to Saint Domingo. So after he had adopted an English name, presumably integrated to some extent in Philadelphia, Peters was now trying to return to Haiti after abolition. A year earlier, a woman named Marinette was taken from Haiti to Philadelphia by her enslaver. Violating Pennsylvania's gradual abolition law, Marinette was held illegally as a slave in the city for a year until her enslaver left for France. In her absence, Marinette built a life for herself in the city. She found employment, and eventually she gave birth to a daughter who she named Melanie. But five years later, her enslaver returned to the city and had Marinette and Melanie, her daughter, arrested for being fugitives from slavery. Marinette and Melanie uh, were legally free at this point, and they won their court case. Uh, but just a week after the court case had been resolved, uh, their enslaver had them arrested again. Marinette had secured freedom for herself and for her daughter, but she could still not avoid her enslaver's harassment. And three years earlier from then, in 1795, a runaway advertisement was placed in a Baltimore newspaper for an enslaved woman named Cecile and a free man named Pierre Lafitte. Cecile had been taken from revolutionary Haiti by her enslaver in October 1793, together with her mother and her youngest sister, and they had been held on a plantation in Frederick County for two years before Lafitte arrived. Lafitte was a, a free white sailor who had found work on the plantation as a gardener, and clearly he and Cecile formed some sort of relationship, although I don't know what that looked like. Um, they escaped early on a Saturday morning. Uh, they took with them a handful of silver cutlery, which her enslaver was sure to detail in the runaway ad. Between 1793 and 1810, as many as 25,000 people left revolutionary Haiti for the United States. And of these, an estimated, very roughly estimated, one third were enslaved, taken from Haiti by enslavers who were escaping a revolution that was predicated on abolition. The Haitian Revolution is often seen, rightly, as one of the most important and dramatic moments of abolition in the early modern history, but this diaspora demonstrates just how contingent, fraught, and reversible revolutionary emancipation could be. Before abolition, enslavers forced enslaved people to travel with them to places like the US, where slavery remained legal, and after abolition, a lack of resources and options meant that some enslaved, uh, formerly enslaved people excuse me, were still vulnerable to efforts to coerce them to leave. My aim by examining this process is not only understand how people got to the United States physically, but to deepen our understanding of the process of abolition itself in revolutionary Haiti. 
What did slavery actually look like on the ground at the moment of abolition? Uh, what did abolition actually mean in practice to the people who were freed? And how did this play out on a micro level, on a relationship level? In addition to this, I am deeply interested in understanding what happens to these people once they arrived in the United States. And I focus in particular on how enslaved Haitians interacted with the law as they made different claims to different types of freedom. Many traveled across multiple jurisdictions on their way to the United States, and they often continued to travel whether by their own choice or by force once they had arrived. For some, these travels between jurisdictions with different legal regimes made the difference between slavery and freedom and Haitians drew on legal knowledge that they had gathered during these travels to make a range of different types of claims uh, from uh, legal manumission to uh, freedom seeking and they did it by suing for wrongful enslavement, by seeking aid from local manumission societies, staking claims to freedom based on French abolition or running to free soil, which after abolition included trying to get back to Haiti. And the third aim of this project is to look at the family and community ties that really undergirded these processes for everyone involved. Virtually everyone who left revolutionary Haiti was separated from family, uh, and even those who were lucky enough to travel in some sort of family group were often vulnerable to separation once they arrived. And once they did arrive, many began to build new forms of families and become parts of larger communities that not only shaped their lives, but informed their efforts to seek freedom, for example, by sharing legal knowledge with each other, by seeking freedom together, or by uh, protecting, in particular, um, enslaved mothers who protected their children's claims to freedom, for example, or enslaved and manumitted women. So these types of journeys, uh, journeys like Joseph Peter's, like Marines and Melanie's, uh, and Cecile's, can tell us how enslaved and formerly enslaved people navigated the Haitian Revolution uh, in the Atlantic world. Uh, they also reveal how enslavers reacted to abolition and revolution by using every resource at their disposal to maintain their control. And so what my project really hopes to do overall is to get to the heart of questions around how Atlantic slavery in this period functioned, persisted, and then ultimately collapsed. So thank you. Mm -hmm. So next up is Joao Batista Nascimento Gregoire, uh, the History Predoctoral Fellow at the University of Kansas. So thank you so much for being here. It's so exciting to have these events back in person again. I'm a second year Predoctoral Fellow, and last year everything was online. I like this much better. <laughs> and so the title of my dissertation is Fighting the Myth of Racial Demo Democracy from Within, Black Political Action in Brazil. Me I cover the mid-1970s to early 2000s. My dissertation reconstructs the story of how Afro-Brazilians demanded greater political representation and state institution inclusion in the period known in Brazilian historiography as abertura, which translates roughly as political opening. Uh, this is a moment that marks the transition from military dictatorship to democracy that took place at the end of 1970. So Brazil was a, had a military dictatorship between 1964 to 1985, but at the end, during the mid-1970s, towards the end of the decade, the government started a very slow and government-led process of democratization. Uh, this research aims to make it apparent that black political action in the last quarter of the 20th, 20th century was pivotal to the enactment of unprecedented ethno-racial policies that represent the first signs of disruption of what has been the cru cruelest enemy of Afro-Brazilians in their fight against racism, namely the myth of racial democracy, which is a sponsor in government uh, which is a narrative that's sponsored by the government and also by Brazilian society at large uh, that argues that Afro-Brazilians are not subject to either racism or racial discrimination. So in this dissertation, I demonstrate the direct connection between the revolutionary anti-racial discrimination reform devised in Brazil in the past decades and the actions of a group of Afro-Brazilians operating within the political system. My research shifts the conventional focus from the federal government and places the roots of such ethno-racial reform with, within the, the realm of black politics. 
So it's very common in Brazil, there is this big political debate of what president was responsible for these ethno-racial uh, policies that were devised in Brazil, which includes, for example, the land tenure of traditional Afro-Brazilian communities, that racism became a crime rather than a misdemeanor, as of before, the mandatory teaching of African and Afro-Brazilian history, uh, this is an example of this package of policies. So I, what I'm doing here is shifting the focus on the federal government and demonstrating how all these policies, they only happened because of the, the actions of this group of Afro-Brazilians that were operating within the political system. Um, Brazil, as a country with the second largest black population in the world and the sponsor of a state narrative that proclaimed, proclaimed itself as a champion of racial equality, presents a unique case to understand how racially stratified societies dealt with the coexistence of the exclusion of black people from critical institutional spaces and racially inclusive narrative of nationhood. So it's very common for Brazilians to say that there is no racism in Brazil, there is no racial discrimination, at the same time that they deny significant positions of significant power to people of color in Brazil. So two central questions that this dissertation address are how did these black political agents mobilize to redefine their roles in Brazilian society and turn the political sphere into their main ground of contestation? And once they were able to carve out a place in formal politics, how they deployed this unprecedented access to institutional resources in political spaces to address the issue of, issue of racial inequality within the political system. And finally, uh, my dissertation seeks to demonstrate the potential of the field of Afro-Brazilian politics, which is still a very emerging uh, field. Uh, so the historiography of race in Brazil has been instrumental in uncovering the autonomy of Afro-Brazilians in the cultural realm and the importance of culture as a form of social protest. Although, but on the other hand, corresponding consideration has not been directed to demonstrate, demonstrating how black Brazilians have acted as protagonists of their own history in the political setting. Because it's still, it's the, the field of Afro-Brazilian politics or racial politics in, in Latin America is a field that is still uh, largely underdeveloped. Uh, so I intend to make it inequivocal that the rich yet under the valid and under researched history of black Brazilian politics is punctuated by a self determined intellectually driven, and politically conscious mobilization. Mm -hmm. okay. Introduce my dear colleague, Kelsey Moore. She's a first year pre-doctor fellow and a PhD candidate in history from uh, John Hopkins University. Um, first, I would like to thank everyone for coming out this evening. I especially want to thank everyone at the Carter G. Woodson Institute, from Dr. Vincent, Gaines, the fellows, and Miss Debbie and Mr. Randy for making the few months here, my first few months here, a wonderful environment to work, think, and connect. New Dealers in South Carolina had a vision to create an industrial empire on virgin land, looking to modernize the Palmetto State and undo the status of the South as the premier economic problem of the nation in the 1930s. Politicians and businessmen advocated for the Santee Cooper Hydroelectric and Navigation Project. They viewed the Santee Cooper Project as an opportunity for infrastructural and capital gain. The project promised to bring electricity to rural areas, to secure profit for private businesses, improve general economic conditions, and to eradicate malaria in South Carolina's low country. However, their imagined virgin land was far from untouched. Thousands of black residents lived on old rice and cotton plantations and throughout rural hinterlands of the Santa Cooper region. They often made their homes on the very earth upon which their parents and grandparents toiled and under which those same generations lay buried. To make this land anew thus required more than the land engineer's abstract willingness to clear and drain land, to remove trees and flood fields. Progress for the South 
included uprooting African peoples, both living and dead. In my dissertation, What the Dead Witness, Clearing Black Knowledge in Jim Crow, South Carolina, I examined how the Rural Development Plan of the Santee Cooper Project disturbed interwoven ecological, spiritual, and epistemic traditions held by black South Carolinians. With the establishment of the South Carolina Public Service Authority in 1934, federal and state officials claimed that the Santa Cooper Project would raise the value of the region by adding new electrical and commercial infrastructure. To do so, the project required the clearing of forests, draining of swamps, and most devastatingly, the removal and flooding of nearly 9,000 black graves. Central to my project is answering how did displacing black people, dead and living, become a common sense practice? To answer, I examine how black knowledge and knowledge about black people were mediated through the destruction of land, through deforestation, swamp draining, and, damming of, and the damming of the Santee and, Cooper, Santee and Cooper rivers, which resulted in the reinterment and flooding of black cemeteries to contend with, the question, with questions about ecology, religion, and culture. By challenging, beyond challenging histories of the New Deal, New and Sunbelt South, what animates my, my research is a desire to think differently about black Southerners, their history, and culture. More specifically, I engage with Conjure, a black Southern religion, culture, and epistemology to understand how New Dealers' infrastructure and capital projects crowded out rural black ancestral uses and knowledge of the land. Building on black feminist, black religious, and black studies scholarship, scholarship that challenges Western modes of knowledge production and ways of being, I understand this story, the Santa Cooper Project, as its own conjure story that will transform how scholars will think about black Southern culture. And with that, it is my pleasure to introduce our next pre-doctoral fellow, Christelle Alukoy, who comes from us from the Department of Africana Studies at Harvard University. Thank you. And thank you to the Carter J. Wilson Institute for creating this event, but also since I've been here, creating uh, spaces of intellectual community and nurture. So, uh, in a 1992 open letter to her colleagues in academia, Sylvia Winter asked, how can we marry our thoughts so that we can now pose the questions whose answers can resolve the plight of the jobless archipelagos, the non-human non-human involved categories, and the environment. The task at hand, she, she writes, is to undo the narratively condemned status. This, I believe, encapsulates a key motivation of black studies in general and of this particular project. So the first time proficient, a musician, activist, and friend, was brutalized by the police. He was barely six years old, sleeping on a bench around two in the morning, while his mother, a street seller in Ketu, a neighborhood of Lagos, was walking. The police officer who threw him out of the bench shouted, illegal sleep. This became a joke, as his relatives, friends, went on to use that phrase, illegal sleep, as a nickname. The first time he was arrested, he was 11 years old. South, one of the infamous paramilitary, paramilitary task forces which operate in Lagos at night, was conducting a raid in the area, and as it happens, arrested everyone they could catch. He spent 48 hours in a cell, and in this instance of state-sanctioned kidnapping, his mother had no idea where he was. He went on to learn through countless arrests, false bribes, and beatings that being outside at night in Lagos is a perilous enterprise. Yet, as a musician, performing in public venues, clubs, and bars, as you can imagine, he had no intention to do otherwise. So my dissertation, Black Nocturnal, Maroon Ecologies of the Night in Lagos, explores the historical and ongoing conditions that turn nighttime into one of the most embattled terrains of life in Lagos via ethnographic, archival, and art-based research methods, primarily sonic experiments, cartography, and analog film. A key axis of the field of African colonial history looks at what has been described as a criminalization of everyday life under colonialism and its ongoing afterlife in a so-called post-colonial moment. 
My work, among other things, asks, what does it mean that we think of that criminalization in terms of the everyday, when most of it happened at night? When in fact, what is criminalized, I would argue, might very well be nighttime itself. Nighttime as a key time space of survival, life, and resistance in the colonial city and its post-colonial iteration, so-called post-colonial. <laughs> so, <laughs> how does one historicize and defamiliarize temporal imaginations as deeply embedded as what the night is or represents? In my project, then, I attempt to understand the relationship between nighttime and the category of life. So thinking about nightlife, not just as temporalized entertainment happening at night, but as a crucial terrain of life uh, for urban residents. And in doing so, I highlight how the reproduction of the, of, of the everyday is actually sustained by an unavowed, constantly suppressed, but essential nocturnal underground. As I probe this relationship, I make both historical and ontological arguments. Central to my project is an understanding of the night as a phobic object that comes to animate and is animated in turn by triangulation with other phobic objects, in particular, blackness or Africa, otherwise known as the dark continent, or in Hegelian terms, enveloped, a place enveloped in the dark mantle of the night. And second, the prostitute, as one of the primary targets historically of the night worker status, uh, in criminal England, which gave rise to the invention of policing as we know it later in the 19th century, and, which, and who continues to be one of, of the primary targets of nocturnal policing in contemporary Lagos. So my investigation of nightlife in colonial and contemporary Lagos looks at the often racialized and feminized surplus of meaning that animates imaginations of the night, examines the political economy of those imaginations, how they generate forms of surplus value and extraction for an array of state and power state entities, but also explores the possibilities and freedom that, that every night resident still found in the night. Doing so, I hope to contribute to work that takes seriously the project of research as emancipatory practice. So after these few words, it's my pleasure to introduce the next predictoral fellow, second year predictoral fellow and PhD candidate in history for the University of Minnesota Twin Cities, Abraham Sela. Good evening, everyone. It's so nice to see you in person. Uh, my name is Abraham Seda. I'm a pre-doctoral fellow in my second year, and I'm also a PhD candidate in African history at the University of Minnesota. My research examines the issue of boxing and settler colonialism in colonial Zimbabwe, previously known as Rhodesia. Between the periods of 1890 and 1980, colonial administrators were very interested in using sports purposes of social control and believe that African men could be taught the conventions of boxing as a way of disciplining them. Boxing was also seen as a, as a better alternative to street fighting, an acceptable pastime through which African men could channel their aggressions. African men were, however, not passive recipients of colonial pastimes. They modified and experimented with boxing in ways that were ultimately considered subversive. <clears throat> The boxing ring became a site of communal recreation, entertainment, where controlled substances such as alcohol and marijuana were consumed against stipulated and existing regulations. In a highly regimented colonial space, Africa, the boxing ring became a high, I'll take that again. In a highly regimented colonial space, African boxing became a highly complex and autonomous sport that was not tethered to colonial designs of subject formation. Fearing that boxing culture in the city might lead to violent uprisings, colonial settlers in Rhodesia attempted to ban the sport, but these plans were later all dropped, fearing further protests from African men. I framed the boxing ring as a crucial site of the colonial encounter. One of the defining features of boxing in colonial Zimbabwe was the use of indigenous medicines and power objects. These were widely used by African men from colonial territories such as colonial Zambia, Malawi, Zimbabwe, and South Africa. 
The use of these medicines became so widespread that colonial administrators attempted to ban their use. For colonial administrators, these beliefs were dismissed as superstitious nonsense. My research rejects colonial characterizations of these objects and rituals. Instead, I highlight the cultural worlds that African boxers created through indigenous power objects in fighting. Emboldened by these power objects, African boxers challenged colonial authority in very explicit ways, which included refusing to be arrested and mockingly daring members of the British South African police to get into the ring and fight them. My research also extends beyond the borders of colonial Zimbabwe. I tread the transnational secular colonial solidarities in Southern Africa, which led to coordinated attempts to control boxing between colonial Zimbabwe, apartheid South Africa, and colonial Zambia. I situate these transnational histories within the broader context of the British Empire and racial politics of boxing in the United States. In 1908, when John Johnson became the first black world heavyweight champion, there was significant censorship of his images in South Africa. And when John Lewis subsequent triumphs by black boxers such as John Lewis over white opponents were also seen as damaging to notions of white supremacy in the colonial world. And within two years of each other, colonial Zimbabwe and apartheid South Africa passed mm -hmm. identical laws, literally word for word, the Boxing and Wrestling Control Acts, which effectively banned interracial boxing. I argue that these collaborations provide significant, provide an early and significant example of the interface between settler colonialism, race, and sport across colonial boundaries. Some of the sources that I've used for my research include oral histories, colonial newspapers, missionaries, missionary reports, and intergovernment communications. And to introduce my next colleague, um, I'll pass it on to Alexis Trio from the University of Dipari. Um, hello, so I'm Alexis Trio. Um, and, uh, and I'm an historian of mathematics. So my yeah, PhD dissertation. It's called Mathematics in the Desert, a computed text, an intellectual authority in the 19th century Sahara. Um, and my dissertation focuses on a corpus of text, mathemat of mathematical manuscripts, uh, written in Arabic by Muslim scholars uh, in the 19th century. So uh, starting from the 1990s, uh, uh, the, the mathematical manuscripts found in West Africa, uh, start to get uh, catalogued uh, at quite a, a, a quick rate uh, by Western scholars. And this, uh, this is going to accelerate. Um, it's kind of at a peak right now uh, in reaction to uh, events in Mali uh, to save the libraries of Tombouctou, for example. So a researcher have now available uh, a, a big, a big uh, volume of manuscripts uh, that need to be exploited. And among those manuscripts, some are dealing with mathematics. And the difficulties that uh, researchers are facing is that uh, those mathematical manuscripts are treaties or fragments of treaties. And so it's quite easy to find them. It's, you can read them. But then it's hard to understand what they were used for and uh, why they were either bought from outside of, the most, uh, outside of West Africa or written by West African locals. And that's what I planned on solving with my PhD. Uh, so to do that, I focus on one particular Mauritanian scholar from the 19th century, uh, Sidi al Kabir, who um, was a saint and a local authority of, uh, of renown, and who, uh, because his, uh, his grandson was very close to the French colonial power, uh, managed to enter the um, uh, Western Academia uh, pipeline uh, as an object, not as an author, uh, earlier than the rest. So we know a bit more about his library than we do about other scholars, which is why I focus on him, because we have kind of snapshots 
of his libraries as, dif as different time. So we can know with some precision what he read, what he wrote, and what. Um, so my uh, PhD focused mostly on uh, three, um, three types of mathematical text. Uh, the first type is a text that has to do, that have to do with uh, uh, number literacy. So how people were taught how to count, uh, with, uh, with which numerals, which, I mean, did they even use numerals? And for that, I focused mainly on a text by a 19th century uh, Mauritanian scholar, Amboya Alwalati, uh, who wrote a commentary of uh, a very famous arithmetical text by uh, an Andalusian uh, scholar. And uh, the text that he wrote is a commentary of, uh, of a treatise by this intelligent scholar. And it shows how uh, le, West African uh, learned uh, number literacy and essentially used uh, what you can think of as Arabic numbers uh, for to, uh, to do calculations. So some of those calculations are relatively simple, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. Uh, and some of the process are a bit more complicated. So for example, you have uh, things like proportional returns, or you have uh, proofs that are, I think, called casting out in, uh, in English. Um, my my math mathematical schooling was done in French, so sometimes. Um, so the second type of text that I, that I look at are texts dealing with uh, the use of mathematics to solve uh, legal problems in Islam. And in particular, uh, texts that look at how uh, mathematics was used to solve inheritance uh, calculation problems. So on this, Sidi uh, Al-Tabir, so the owner of the library, was, uh, is still remembered today as an expert. And he wrote himself a treatise on the subject. Uh, so my dissertation demonstrates that uh, even though the mathematical underlying uh, it is there, and there is a relationship between the treatise of Ambuya, of Ambuya and the treatise of Sidia. Um, be, because uh, the text of um, uh, the text of uh, Farah inheritance uh, had to um, had to fulfill some uh, had to conform to a, to a form of legal orthodoxy. Uh, the mathematical uh, uh, aspects are very much under, under the hood, so to say. And the third part of my project looked at a very odd text produced by Celia that uh, precisely tried to take the mathematics that are under the hood of uh, inheritance project and put them at the forefront. So uh, this text is a fatwa, meaning a, a legal opinion uh, written by a Muslim scholar uh, that he wrote himself. And that basically um, produce and solve the case of a man dying, leaving behind two sons and three intersex children. And what I demonstrate is that uh, Cydia produced this, uh, this fatwa for two reasons. One is creating a, a wholly new uh, legal, uh, legal question by looking at a case with three uh, intersex. The fact that there are three is very important and uh, really uh, the kind of the heart, actually, of this uh, fatwa. And the second is that uh, while doing his demonstration, he hides a very crucial part of the process for the reader as a kind of a mathematical, uh, a mathematical challenge. And uh, I take this as a, as a proof that uh, mathematical, uh, mathematical mastery had uh, a value uh, as a proof of intellectual authority in the 19th century in um, yeah, that's all. Mm -hmm. I'm going to introduce the first uh, postdoc now. Uh, <laughs> so please welcome Anna Johnson. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you all for being here. Um, and thanks to everyone who worked to make this event possible, and of course, also the fellowship possible. Uh, so my name is Anna Dunsing. Uh, I received my PhD in hist history and African-American studies from Yale University this past May. 
Uh, my work in general is grounded in African American history, in the history of black political radicalism, and I think also important to note in you know, moving from the other perspective in, in studying the evolving politics of white supremacist ideology and racial capitalism across the 20th century. So here at the Woodson, I am um, getting used to saying that I am working on my first book manuscript. Um, it's tentatively entitled, Fascism is Already Here, Civil Rights and the Making of a Black Anti-Fascist Tradition. And the title um, may sound familiar to you. It comes from a well-known quote from the black revolutionary thinker George Jackson. Um, Settle your quarrels, he wrote in 1971. Come together, understand the reality of our situation, understand that fascism is already here, that people are already dying who could be saved, that generations more will die or live poor, butchered half-lives if you fail to act. So surely some of you will have encountered this most recent iteration of the you know, debates about the F word in the United States, <laughs> debates about fascism that usually take the form of will it or won't it, or has it ever happened here, or can it still happen here? And there were many avenues that led me to this project, um, both as a dissertation, of course, now as a book, but one of the most public facing ones and one of the most urgent ones was a frustration that these conversations, along with much of the long arc of scholarship of both fascism and anti-fascist resistance, um, it really failed to take full account of analogous conversations happening in black intellectual discourse and in the black public sphere, both in the United States and within the African diaspora, really, for nearly a century now. And so at the same time, my early research as a graduate student indicated a sophisticated and evolving anti-fascism that was very much alive in black political thought and very much also alive as a popular vernacular, almost as like a common sense within the black public sphere. Again, dating back to the 1920s and 1930s. So as, as such, my work seeks to uncover a long, continuous, and highly influential anti-fascist tradition within black radical thought and activism across the 20th century. I view my task as uncovering, but also really as the work of threading together strains of anti-fascism that are abundantly clear and pervasive in nearly every archive I visit, merged with strains of anti-racist, anti-capitalist, and anti-colonial struggle. And so I'm following historical thinkers such as W.E.B. Du Bois, Claudia Jones, and George Padmore, as well as more recent scholarship from Cedric Robinson, Paul Gilroy, Angela Davis, and many others. And my book uh, argues for the centrality of black radical political thought and grassroots organizing to understanding this enduring problem of fascism in the United States and really pushing it past the idea that this is mere analogy or hyperbole or invective. And my approach bridges social, intellectual, and political history, black studies scholarship, and more recent scholarship on uh, the modern US right. My vision is a narrative-driven history in which ideas about US fascism and anti-fascist resistance are embodied in a collective biography of activists, artists, and intellectuals, and their broad, kind of diffuse, multiracial coalitions. Essentially showing these networks kind of crisscrossing, um, but really active at the radical edges of the black freedom struggle from the 1930s to 1980s. And these networks, just to give you some examples, they included black GIs who liberated Nazi concentration camps, communist journalists reporting on the Nuremberg trials for the black press, and then one month later covering police brutality in Tennessee, uh, seasoned Jewish anti and anti Italian anti-fascist factor into my story, specifically those who infiltrated fascist groups in the United States. I also write about freedom riders who confronted Confederate stars and bars stitched to swastikas, black radical exiles in Cuba, Ghana, and East Germany, and finally political prisoners like Jackson who theorized the walls and trenches so central to the US racial order. And to get at the substance of my, the black anti-fascist critique that I'm trying to document, my work also takes really seriously and interrogates the actual actors, groups, practices, and institutions that they theorize, document, uh, condemn, and often clash with in the streets. Uh, in this way, I engage with archives of scholarship on the right, on global fascism and its afterlives, on racist right-wing violence, and other forms of white backlash. 
And in this way, I see my work as relational, as a story of left and right, mobilized in relation to one another. And um, I guess to, to wrap up, um, in following these figures across five decades, I argue that this anti-fascist tradition served many purposes and changed over time, but all the while it remained rooted in a conviction that a uniquely American form of fascism was possible. And it was one that was born from the legacies of settler colonialism and chattel slavery, but in fact intensified after 1945, after the military collapse of fascism in Europe. Thank you very much. colleague and fellow, postdoctoral fellow, Amber Henry, who received her PhD in anthropology from the University of Pennsylvania. Good evening. I'd like to extend my thanks to the Woodson Fellowship for this fantastic opportunity to be a part of this esteemed intellectual community. My book project, entitled Inalienable Bodies, Palenquera Women and Embodied Sovereignty in the Colombian Caribbean, centers the lives of people from San Basilio de Palenque, which is a maroon community in the northwest region of Colombia, who have built their identity around African-centered traditions, language, and culture. Today, Palenquera women are configured as the face of the nation amidst the Colombian government's efforts to showcase the nation's ethnic diversity in a series of tourism and multicultural campaigns. This project is an attempt to understand what it is like to live in the midst of these conditions. This is a story about sovereignty. In the wake of the plantation, but also in the midst of ongoing processes of dispossession. My approach in this project is twofold. First, I analyze the discursive, symbolic, and affective processes through which state and private actors configure Palenquera women into these kind of uh, stereotypical folkloric symbols of the past. Second, I uncover the quotidian practices through which Palenquera women fashion their bodies as a locus of sovereign power and also practice modes of everyday refusal and connect themselves with the African diaspora. In this way, my project seeks to answer three central questions. First, how might attention to the body allow us to see both sovereignty and its counterweight dispossession as not just these abstract political ideologies, but as felt intensities that are connected to the body? Second, what are the techniques and technologies through which this sovereignty becomes fastened to the body? And finally, what are the uses and limitations of sovereignty for both black and indigenous communities in 21st century Latin America? I argue that through strategic deployments of refusal, opacity, and disavowal, Palinqueta women are able to refute these processes of dispossession and affirm their sovereign status even while they're actively participating in essentialized forms of cultural performance for tourism. My work makes important contributions to the field of Africana studies by developing three central analytical concepts. The first is embodied sovereignty. I ask, how might we come to understand sovereignty as tied to more than just geographical spaces or land, but also tied to the flesh? evoking what Anna Laura calls body lands. I define embodied sovereignty as a mode of self-governance in which the body emerges as both the site and a vector of sovereign power, and illustrate how Palinqueta women practice embodied sovereignty through a series of, of significant bodily practices. Second, if we do understand sovereignty is connected to the body, then how does it come into view? While much like traditional notions of, of sovereignty tied to land, embodied sovereignty is often made legible once it is challenged, trespassed upon, and threatened. I call this processes of alienation, which is a state of unrecognition through which individuals come to feel a sense of disjuncture from themselves. 
This alienation is carried out by a constellation of factors such as multicultural practices, state-sponsored tourism, and heritage conservation. These, emerge, these give birth to symbolic tropes that attempt to uncouple Palenquera women from their sovereign attachments. So the resulting feeling of disembodiment and dispossession produces what Franz Fanon has described as feelings of being an object among objects, or what Woodson fellow Zakia Iman Jackson has called the thingification of blackness, the process of imagining the black person as an empty vessel, as a non-being, an ontological zero. So I argue that these conditions collide to produce what I term inalienable bodies, a state of inhabitants in which individuals insist upon their embodied sovereignty while living in the midst of processes of alienation. Here the parentheticals signal the historical and contemporary barricades, such as colonialism, plantation slavery, and ongoing anti-black violence, against and within which black beings must contend. This called up the words of Audre Lorde, I felt the battle lines being drawn up in my body. To conclude, in a context where multiculturalism, diversity, equity, and inclusion are commonplace, my project urges for a rethinking of sovereignty and its counterweight disposition, dispossession as more than abstract political ideologies, but as felt intensities that are registered in and through the body. Thank you. to the Woodson Institute for all of the support. I'm so grateful to be here, um, especially in person, and then the benefits of going close to last, seeing everyone's wonderful presentations. Um, so thank you. So my name is Nicole Ramsey. I'm a second year postdoctoral fellow working on book project manuscript on Blackness Nation and performance in Belize, and tentatively titled Sub Umbra Floreo, Under, um, Under the Shade I Flourish, Performing the Belizean Nation. So understandings of race and identity in Belize, a former British colony and the only country in Central America where English is the official language, has raised questions as to what category or region the relatively young nation belongs. Belize's status as a Caribbean and Central American country situates the nation, which gained its independence in 1981, as both a multicultural and black zone within the region, while also serving as a transnational space imbued with varied forms of diasporic blackness. My project extends current scholarship on blackness in Central America by examining how black Belizeans come to see themselves as part of the nation while navigating configurations of identity in the in-between spaces they occupy. In centering two of Belize's dominant African descended population, Belizean Creoles and the black indigenous Garinahu or Garifuna, my project examines how black Belizeans express and perform identity through post-colonial and gendered national commemorations, the digital space, migration, tourism, visual culture, and everyday articulations of Belizeanness. So drawing on digital ethnography and close readings of popular cultural performances and participant observation in Belize City and California, I examine how the Belizean nation is made and remade through performances that also transcend national boundaries. In addition to exploring how black Belizeans negotiate their identities transnationally as a result of migration and media, I contend that these transnational and translocal spaces produce a distinctive type of Belizean identity, one that is diasporic, gendered, and always informed by its ambiguous placement in the region. An identity that not only disrupts common perceptions of blackness and indigeneity in Latin America and the Caribbean, but also entails various forms of self-making and underscore the many negotiations and contradictions of black Belize and subjectivity. So I build upon this, um, I build upon Central American Caribbean scholarship, particularly Deborah Thomas, Shona Jackson's work, as well as Mimi Scheller, and African diaspora theory to further illustrate the nuanced and imaginative ways that black Belizeans draw from various archives and diasporic resources in creating a transnational identity that pulls from various locations throughout the diaspora is perpetually hybrid and ambiguous and speaks to a very recent colonial past. 
So the first half of my project explores the socio-historical conditions and national projects that have structured Belizean identity and how blackness through cultural production and visual culture were vital in shaping the nation's space pre and post independence. I engage in both ethnographic practices, autoethnography to examine how black Belizeans in Belize City negotiate Belizean identity through national commemorations, such as September 10th, which is a creolized ethnogenesis masculinist national or origin holiday commemorating, commemorating the battle between Spanish and British forces, Independence Day, and of course, Garrison Settlement Day. I also examine the national constructions of the Belizean nation by means of representational politics through a close reading of several commercial and tourist advertisements focused on new media and cultural production, production that draw on the peculiarities of Belizean ethnic relations. The second portion of my project utilizes digital ethnography to examine how digital technology and digital spaces are used to forge community with, with other Belizeans throughout the diaspora. In navigating alternative systems of nationhood and self-making through message boards and photo archives, I show that the Belizean diaspora's use of digital space provides another useful site for articulation that draws on transnational migration, digital placemaking, memory, and identity in the online sphere outside of the physical geographic landscape. As a fellow, I expand on this initial work and I'm researching and drafting additional chapters that turn to the Belizean diaspora and centers gender, migration, and transnationalism within the space of Caribbean California, Los Angeles to be exact. Los Angeles is an important site for Black Central American and Caribbean experiences in the West, and particularly an arena in which Black Belizean identities are negotiated in the context of U.S. Blackness and Mestizo Brown Los Angeles. I center Black Belizean women, many of whom migrated as domestic and cultural workers, to show how understandings of race, gender, and nation in Belize and the diaspora were also produced through labor relations and post-colonial attachments. With this project, I also speak to the common notion that a place like Belize is too black to be so solely Central American and too indigenous to be solely Caribbean. My interventions also ask the question of what happens when you place them into conversation with each other in ways that center the African diaspora, migration, and transnationalism. I also center and show how oral traditions and storytelling is central to the Belizean identity. And as a second generation of myself, I'm inspired and motivated and come to this work through these stories, oral histories and lived experiences that are seldom taken up in Belizean historiography and within the region, especially black Belizeans and black women. So that's my project and thank you all so much. For I'll now turn it over to my colleague, Alexandria Smith, um, a second year postdoctoral fellow, um, who also gained her PhD in Women, Gender, and Sexualities from Rutgers University. Okay, hello everyone. It's great to see and be with all of you this evening. My name is Alexandria Smith, and I earned my PhD in Women's, Gender, and Sexuality Studies from Rutgers University in 2021. I'm a scholar of Anglophone, Black women's, feminist, and queer literary and cultural production. I foreground Black feminist and queer theoretical approaches, meaning that I'm invested in thinking about how ideas of gender, sex, and sexuality inform the lived experiences of Black people, as well as how my interlocutors construct and engage these ideas in their creative work. I am a second year postdoctoral fellow, and I am currently teaching a class called Life Writing in the Black Diaspora. In this class, we are closely examining three very different literary texts, P.S.A. Lehman's Heavy, Dion Brand's A Map to the Door of No Return, which we began discussing today, and Akweke Amezi's Freshwater. Last spring, I taught Racing Gender, which traced the idea that blackness disrupts normative gender categories through black feminist, queer, and trans studies scholarship. As a Woodson Fellow, I have been in the process of developing my first book project, a phrase that I also still feel weird <laughs> saying, a manuscript called Sensual Worldmaking, Black Queer Feminist Theorizations of Feeling. I define sensual worldmaking as a self-reflective method of literary and theoretical knowledge production in which authors draw from embodied experience and critiques, their own as well as others, of racial and gendered inequality as sources in their writing. 
In this project, I use narrative and discourse analysis to illustrate how 20th and 21st century black queer and feminist writers theorize power, intimacy, and geographic space through embodiment. The artistic work created by black women and queer people has experienced increased visibility and accessibility to general and academic readers since the 1970s, particularly here in the United States. Academic spaces ranging from workshops, conferences, courses, and more recently, tenure track lines, which is exciting, evidence the increased social awareness of black creative and intellectual work created by women, queer people, and others who are not cis heterosexual men. Even in light of this increased awareness, there is so much more space for considering the aesthetic and theoretical work that black queer self-reflection accomplishes. My research draws together black feminist scholarship on literary criticism, the productive work of feelings and emotions, the importance of embodiment, and the insistence on non-dominant ways of knowing in order to illustrate the kinds of creative self-analysis that black queer and femme artists undertake. As an example of this, in a few weeks, I will workshop a chapter in progress on the work of Michelle Cliff, a Jamaican poet and author whose writing critically examined the literary and cultural construction of facets of her own identity, including Creole and Jamaican national identity, blackness, whiteness, womanhood, queer sexuality, and being a post-colonial subject. In particular, this chapter looks at Cliff's strategic narrations and contextualizations of her own lived experience in the book Claiming an Identity They Taught Me to Despise as part of a critique of the ways Creole identity relies on embodied white supremacy. In my reading, I understand Cliff's ambivalence towards readings of her work as autobiographical, even when it seems to clearly be the case, as rooted in her investment that self-referentiality be taken as one of her many methods of colonial critique, rather than an end in and of itself. I suggest that at stake in this consideration of black queer self-reflective work is a renewed understanding of how ourselves, as they move through a world latticed by unequal and destructive power dynamics, are inextricably tied to the process and products of our creativity. And in addition to my research, writing, and teaching, I enjoy running, hiking, and exploring Charlottesville's food and art scenes, which I talk about whenever I can. And I am so grateful for the time I've spent here at the Woodson, and I look forward to being in continued community with all of you. Thank you. Now, former director Deborah McDowell had a saying, if you want to know what's happening in black studies, where it's going, Find out who's at the Woodson. I think you've heard some example of this. So we are ready to eat and enjoy. And I just want to very quickly say very quick thank you to Associate Director Kevin Gaines, to Woodson staff, Mr. Randy Swift, Mr. James Perla, Ms. Debbie Best, uh, to the wonderful scholars who served on the Woodson Fellowship Selection Committee over these past two years that sifted through hundreds of applications and selected these wonderful young scholars. My last thank you, last but not least, you here and here for joining us for this wonderful occasion. Nasima, that's the live stream. That's <laughs> what the year was for. All right, no more words. Let's eat, let's drink, let's enjoy each other's <laughs>